So one of the one of the things that we need to start doing now as we move into these additive exercises is, uh, well, I, I need to close the book on patterns, basically. And the last part of patterning that I think is, is very versatile um, in terms of both um, manipulating geometry and also generating geometry is the idea of attractor points. Um, you may hear this referred to in a couple different ways. Um, some people call them magnets. Some people call them... Uh, I'm blanking on the other term now for some reason. But uh, anyway, there are a couple different terms. But basically what it is, is it's a uh, proximity-based mathematical um, modification. So you could do it proportionally or just kind of like a straight gradient. So think of it at first when we do these patterning exercises as gradients. Um, but it can be used for a number of different things. Okay, so what we're going to do to start off with is um, we're going to work with geometry on a grid again. So we're going way back to basics here. Um, so let's go to vector and grid, and let's just do a, a square grid. should be fine. <clears throat> we can leave it at the origin and just make your typical sliders like we always do. Make three of them, 0 to 10. Okay, so um, what I'm, I think what I, I guess the geometry that I'm going to start with is, uh, what I like to start with is just the, the, the cell itself. Um, and the cell right here can be done with either surfaces or with um, uh, curves. But for me, I'm going to just, just do surfaces because I think you can see it a little better. So let's start off with that. I'm just going to go up into, um, sorry, params, and let's grab the surface param and just attach that to cells, and it'll convert them all to surfaces. So now going forward, um, I need to describe a lot about how attractor points are going to work here. But in order to, to first, I guess, get us set up, we need to create a point that's going to be our attractor point or our magnet or whatever you want to call it. Um, so let's go into Rhino and just click on the single point command here and drop a point somewhere in the grid that you just created. So it doesn't really matter where. I'll just put one right here. And I'll reference that in also with a param. So I'll go to the point param, set one point, and I'll select that point right there. So here are the tools, right? The tools that we're going to need. If you go up to um, vector and point, the, the two here that are, that are really interesting um, to me for this particular exercise are closest point and closest points. And um, it's one of those things that I don't use it often enough now for me to um, remember whether or not it's the plural one or the singular one. So I think it's closest points, plural. And so what this is going to do is find the closest points in a point collection. And um, that's very, very important because what it's going to do is it's going to search um, from point, a point or points, to a point or points. And then you can define um, essentially how many of the closest um, points you want to find. Um, but um, actually, now I'm thinking it might be the other one. Hold on. Closest point. I think it's closest point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Let's do closest point, singular. So it's going to um, do a point to search from and a point, uh, cloud of points to search. Um, and so this is basically going to give us a couple of different outputs. It'll give us the point that is the closest point to our attractor point. 
and then it'll give us um, the index of that particular point, but it'll also give us the distance between those points, and that's the most important part here because the distance creates a list of points that are proportional to one another based on their proximity. So here's how this works. Um, the point to search from is going to be this point right here. And forgive me, I might do these backwards once or twice. But anyway, um, we need to find a point to reference for every single one of these surfaces, which reasonably would be the centroid, right? The distance of these surfaces from that point we can measure from their centroid. So I'm going to um, go to surface analysis area. It gets me all these centroids and I plug those in right here. <clears throat> um, I think I actually do need closest points. Hang on, let me just flip this around. I always get confused here. Yeah, I think it's reversed, sorry. Um, so because it's asking, so it says the point to search from can be a cloud of points as well. And then this one states um, the cloud of points to search. So it's trying to find a numerical value that's matched up to that. So um, just make sure that the, the points you're searching from, this list of points gets flattened. And so now what it's gonna give you is a, a list of numbers that are measuring their distance from your attractor point. Do I need to pause while you guys get caught up? Okay, so now from here, um, what do you think we can do with the distances? We can do anything that modifies them proportionally based on their proximity, basically. So let's say, for instance, I want to use its distance from this attractor point in order to generate a scale factor. It can be done very, very easily. However, what you have to do is you have to transition that list of numbers in order to match whatever scale factor you're trying to intend to use. So um, essentially, it, it's gonna look a little bit like this. So uh, let's start backward, like working backwards from the transform function, right? So let's go to transform and affine, and we're gonna use scale. Scale will, again, ask for a couple of things. It'll ask for the geometry, that would be our surfaces. It'll ask for the um, center point of scaling, and so that's obviously going to be the centroids. And then we have to give it the scale factor, but we can't give it the distance value because it's going to be massive, right? Because it's scaling it by 70 times. So what I have to give it is a remapping of all of these numbers proportionally relating to one another to a new minimum and maximum value, which is otherwise known as what? Minimum, maximum? Nope. A boundary otherwise known as a domain, right? We're going back into the domains and we're gonna learn how we use it to delimit an already existing set of numbers to a new set of numbers. So anyway, we go back up to math, and domain, and we're going to use um, remap numbers. So remap numbers is going to ask for a value to remap, so that's basically just whatever your source value is. Then it's going to ask for a source domain. Um, and then it's going to ask for a target domain. So what do you think the source domain might be? What, is, what do you think a source domain is? Uh, the point? Hmm? The point? Uh, you're sort of on the right track. It does have to do with what's already there. It's, it is essentially the existing list minimum and maximum value. 
It's it's the minimum, which would be, I think in this case, like a foot or two, and the maximum value, which is like 70 feet. So, um, and then the target domain is going to be whatever you want to remap it to. So, um, to find the existing domain, we can go to domain, and this one right here, it's called bounds. I'm not sure if we used this one before, but. And bounds is going to take this list of numbers when I plug the distances in. It's going to give me what the minimum and maximum values are. So 2.82 feet and 70.7 .7 feet. That's, how, that's the closest and the farthest point from my attractor point. So that is my source domain. And then the values that I'm going to remap are going to be the distances themselves. So everything that exists between those two values, everything that exists within that boundary is going to be remapped from that boundary to a new boundary, which in this case I can construct using domain again. So we're getting construct domain now. And I'll plug that in and uh, give it two more numerical values to, to uh, remap it to. So let me grab this here. And uh, remember, this is gonna be for a scale factor now. So we probably wanna use something that's percentage based, um, but also be aware that you can't scale anything by zero. So you don't wanna set your minimum value to zero. So I'm gonna make it a point, um, 0.1 or 0.10. And then my maximum value is going to be 1. I'll plug these in. So now you can see this R output is a remapped number. And there you have a new list. And you can't quite tell. You can sort of tell if you look at it closely. But you can't quite tell that these are the same numbers proportional to what we had before, but remapped into the 0.1 to 1 range. And so that remapped value gets plugged into the scale factor. Um, and I have an error, and it has to do with the groups. So basically, take a look at the list of scale factors. They're coming in as a straight list. And the geometry is coming in in groups of 10. And also my centroids are coming in, in in groups of 10 as well. So I need to flatten those in order to get them to speak to each other. They need to all be a flattened list here. So I'll flatten. Wow, that actually looks really cool. That looks neat. It's not right, but it's neat looking. Anyway, so then flatten the other one. And then make sure you go back and turn off everything else. And here you can see the new pattern. Pretty cool, right? Then is the second panel point one or point zero? I did point one oh um, to one. And you know, just to just to give you a sense of like how this is really working, I'm gonna make a slider from point one to 1.00 and I'll just override this real fast so that you can see how it how it works parametrically so basically at this point I can just kind of change my my minimum value I can reduce my maximum value I mean that's pretty powerful stuff um, and then also the other thing that I wanted to point out is that you also have the ability of sort of inverting the, the relationship here. So if you wanted the scale factors to reverse and scale the ones that are closest to the point the most, then you basically just do a mathematical function of subtracting these numbers from a value of 1. <clears throat> so um, I suppose I could probably do it with an expression, though I've never tried it this way. 
So I'll go to expression and I'll just say one minus X and there you have the opposite. Pretty neat stuff, right? So that is um, dynamic enough that I can now move this point to anywhere on the pattern. Any questions? No questions. All right, cool. Good to know. Um, let me stop this and uh, then we'll move on to some other cool things with this.